Another big leap for mankind. China successfully launches the first module of its planned space station. We'll take a look at the Chinese space program. Hello, I'm Arnold Naidu, and this is The Heat. The construction of China's space station is underway. The main module was launched into orbit this week, and 11 more modules and missions are planned to finish assembling it. Once ready, it will be used for scientific experiments in microgravity conditions. CGTN's Ning Hong reports. It's a major breakthrough. With the Tianhe, Chinese for Heaven Harmony core module brought into Earth orbit, China's space exploration has entered a new era. I'm very proud to be part of the Tianhe mission. This is a great success for China. The Tianhe core module is able to support three astronauts for three to six months. Upcoming missions to the module will include a cargo ship bearing supplies and a Shenzhou manned spacecraft, which will bring three astronauts up in June this year. By the end of next year, in-orbit construction will be completed and the space station will begin operations. The designed life of the station in orbit is at least 10 years, but with regular maintenance carried out by astronauts and with regular replacements of equipment, the station's life can be extended for some time. China is planning to complete the construction of its space station called the Tiangong or Heaven Palace with 11 intensive launches in 20 months. This will involve another two lab modules and four manned missions. The successful launch of the core module of China's space station marks the beginning of the construction of China's space station. It also opens a new era as Chinese astronauts will be routinely going into space. Ning Hong, CGTN, Wenchang. To talk more about the Chinese space program, let's bring in our panel from Beijing via Skype. Xu Yansong is the Director General of the Asia Pacific Space Organization. Also from Beijing via Skype, Yang Yuguang is a professor at China Aerospace Science and Industry Corporation. Here in Orlando, Florida, John Zarella is a journalist covering the U.S. space program. And Ray Wong from California is the principal analyst and co-founder, a founder rather, of Constellation Research uh, in California. Welcome to all of you. Uh, Xu Yansong, let me start with you. This is yet another milestone for the Chinese space program. What can you tell us about this launch and its significance for the program overall? Well, well we had a hiccup, uh, hiccup with the Long March 5 a couple of years back because the uh, uh, program was designed uh, to start two years ago to construct the Chinese space station. Uh, however, we used that two years to further validate uh, the, the program and even pre-assemble uh, the whole structure uh, in our facility in Tianjin. Uh, so the core stage launch marks the beginning of the construction of the station and uh, intensive launches of the following 11 times would be uh, the completion of the station in two years. So that is very intensive, but the, core, the success of the core stage is the cornerstone if you're building a house. So it's very important milestone step. Uh, to build the Chinese station. So as you say, uh, very intensive. So that means about one launch every two months. Uh, roughly that, because we have uh, manned missions, we have cargo missions. The construction of the station, uh, the station itself is relatively uh, simple by three major launches of the Long March 5B, but <clears throat> it will be followed by cargo missions, a uh, series of Long March 7 that to fuel the station as well as uh, manned missions. Uh, so these will uh, also requires the launch from different launching sites. For the manned mission, we launch it from Jiuquan, and the uh, Long March 5 and uh, Long March 7 are done in Wenchang, in Hainan Island. So these are launches uh, subsequently happening. So even not two months, but uh, in the coming months, uh, 30 days or 40 days, we'll be having, having total of three launches, including this one, and a cargo mission as well as the manned mission. 
Yang Yuguang, uh, as we just heard, this will be the first of 12 missions to construct uh, this space station. So uh, what can we see over the next two years? How will this uh, unfold for us? Well, you see that uh, uh, with the successful launch of the Tianhe module, the construction of the uh, China Space Station has begun. But uh, before the construction uh, can be completed, we must also uh, test uh, many of the technologies. Uh, that is why we, after this launch, we will launch the Tianzhou 2 cargo ship to provide supplies and some of the necessary equipment, instruments to, uh, to the core module. And then we will launch the uh, Shenzhou 12 to test the long-term residence in space, uh, actually speaking, in three months in space. And the most uh, important is to test the regenerative life support system in this station. This is critical for the future operation and the control of the cost of the station. And then we will use the uh, Tianzhou 3 and the Shenzhou uh, 13 mission to uh, let the astronauts stay there for six months. Uh, I should also emphasize that the current Tianhe is the test core module, not officially uh, the formal one. So only after this test and the uh, technology demonstration can be completed and it can be confirmed it is okay, we can name that uh, it is the core module. Uh, if it's not okay, we will send another core module, uh, the formal one, uh, to handle the uh, problems we met during the technology testing. So after that, we will launch the uh, uh, Wentian experimental module and the Mengtian experimental module. So there will be 11 launches uh, within two years. And also, uh, after this co construction, uh, there will also be another uh, optical module called the Xuntian, which will have a large telescope with a uh, aperture about two meters. John Zara, the uh, International Space Station, which is currently orbiting uh around us is larger than the planned Chinese one. It also has a longer lifespan. Uh, the Chinese one will last about 10 years. We'll have a lifespan of 10 years. Now, you've covered space exploration and space science for years. Why are these kinds of stations important? Why are these missions important? Wow, it's huge. What, what China's doing is huge because everybody I've talked to said, look, you have one station up there, you put two up there. Look at how much more science you're going to get. And a great deal of the science that has been going on on the International Space Station has been directed toward understanding how space affects the human body. If you're going to do long duration missions to, the, to, the, to Mars, even if you're going to go to the moon and just have astronauts spend more than a few days there, you need to know how space affects the human body. And it does some strange things. Here's an example. Um, a vast majority, of, a great majority of U.S. astronauts who come back from long duration flights, not seven days a week, but those that spend time on the International Space Station, have come back with some form of vision loss. And some of it has been permanent vision loss. So they don't understand why that is. That's still ongoing. Uh, but the interesting caveat to that is that female astronauts never get that same, never get that issue. So there's a lot of things that have to be understood about long durations in space. And I assume that much of what China is going to be doing with their space station is trying to understand that as well, the effects on the human body, as well as everything else that goes into it, whether it's manufacturing of medical uh, new, new discoveries in medicine, uh, all kinds of things that are done up there uh, to help back here on Earth. But one of the primary things is understanding how the body is affected by long durations in space. Ray Wong, I want to get to the goals of this project in just a moment, but first we have this report from CGTN's Wei uh, Wu Lei. Here on Earth, an apple will fall due to gravity's influence but in outer space, it floats like this. But how might this apple mutate in the microgravity environment? What might happen when an astronaut eats this apple? China has sent 11 astronauts into space since 2003. During their time in space, the astronauts have carried out a variety of experiments. But the time for each visit was limited. China is aiming to remedy this by building a brand new space station by the end of 2022, which is expected to remain in space for over 10 years, allowing astronauts who spend time there to engage in longer physical, biological, and cosmological experiments. As
as for experiments, Chinese scientists are interested in growing plants. These flowers and vegetables were growing from seeds mutated in space. The effects of living in space are also of concern for scientists. Knowing how to guarantee the ability for astronauts to have a healthy long-term stay in space could pave the way for future space travel. China's new space station won't just be for Chinese scientists, but also for global scientists as well. So far, a total of nine projects proposed by 17 countries, including Germany, France, and Italy, have been selected for the first round of experiments to be conducted in this new space lab. This new facility is expected to open up a brand new chapter in human space exploration. That report there from CGTN's Wu Lei. So, Ray, uh, John Zarella was telling us a moment ago that, you know, one of the major reasons for these kinds of missions is to look at how the human body uh, and human beings are impacted while spending lengthy periods of time in space. Uh, but um, how, the, how could these missions impact life for us on Earth? Yeah, there's a lot of new discoveries. John's completely right. I mean, what you're seeing is we can see synthesis of new types of proteins, amino acids. We're going to see synthesis of new types of material science. We're trying to figure out what we can do in terms of, you know, uh, the food and the food supply that's going to be required. Um, and that's all lessons that are going to be taken back. What's interesting about Tianhe is that it's actually it's got a fast data module and fast internet connectivity that's going to be different than what's on ISIS. And that's going to allow them to be able to exchange data much more quickly and get more real-time information on experiments. Um, the other thing that's interesting in general is just in space exploration, what we're really trying to do is, is understand a couple of things. What's the supply chain that's required to get up there? What's the uh, tolerance levels that are going to be on the materials that are in that space station? Can they be reapplied? We might see that those same material science being used for medical equipment. We see that for lightweight transportation. We might see other initiatives that are going to be created around clean energy, green energy use, right? And it's a good way to test what we're doing in terms of, you know, battery technology, of course, solar technology, and of course, what we can do with optics. Uh, I think they're going to put a new space telescope up there as well. Uh, Xu Yuanchang, China, of course, is building the station and launching these modules into space, but many other countries want to be part of this project. How important is this kind of international cooperation? When well, we did extend our invitation all the, to the, all the international community, and we're using also the platform of UN USA as well as UN COPIUS, the peaceful, uh, Committee on Peaceful Use of Outer Space. So these are our mutual benefits and uh, mutual platforms that has no, a good number of uh, countries, including developing countries. So we uh, certainly hope to use the platform and inviting all countries to take full advantage uh, of the Chinese program uh, to put their application projects on board the mission. This is similar to the Chang'e Chang 4 mission that we invited the Europeans and other countries, and they put instruments on board uh, which has been landed on the far side of the moon and had a very successful mission. We're, we want to do similar things. And uh, international cooperation is part of the Chinese program. So in addition to uh, these modules carrying experiments from other countries, could we see international crews perhaps be on the module itself? Indeed, we had a, a bilateral agreement with the European Space Agency, and both sides has been uh, intensively uh, cooperating on the astronaut perspective. Um, uh, uh, astronaut has been trained in Europe uh, in one of the uh, survival skills in the in the cave areas, and also European astronauts has been trained in uh, in the Bohai Sea in Qingdao for uh, for escape uh, uh, and. Uh, it, Danger, uh, you know, like uh, emergency escape uh, process, and also the astronauts from Europe has been learning Chinese so that they can work together in the station. So uh, some things are on ongoing uh, with the Europeans. Uh, Yang Yuguang, China, of course, could not be part of the International Space Station. That's because of a law in the United States here yeah, that restricts collaboration between the United States and China on these kinds of missions. So what is the significance of China building its own international space station and, and working with other countries? Well, you know, for a space capital nation of China, it is very important to have its own uh, capabilities in many space activities. Uh, 
you know, that's, this is not the goal uh, to have this kind of activities. As we've already discussed, to study the uh, influence of the space environment to human body, and also uh, many engineering research, for instance, uh, we, uh, in years before, if we want to test some new technologies or new subsystem uh, of a spacecraft, we need to uh, launch a test uh, satellite. But if we have a sp space station, we can just uh, uh, put that payload into the cargo ships, and it will be uh, it will be tested in the station. So it will, it will be uh, very efficient to perform scientific research and engineering research it is very important. Uh, on the other hand, as you mentioned, uh, the international cooperation is very important for China. It has uh, been uh, uh, revealed in the White Book of China's space activities that the international uh, cooperation is one of the uh, benchmark for China to become an advanced country in space field. So this uh, space station, as we've discussed, will be a very important platform, not only as the national space, uh, national uh, laboratory of China in space, but be the platform for international cooperation. Uh, there are four levels of cooperation uh, on this station. The first is the joint experiments, as we already done and we've already discussed. Also, as uh, as Yan Zhong has mentioned, mentioned the visit of foreign astronauts by Shenzhou spaceship, and even the visit of the foreign uh, uh, spacecrafts from other countries. Uh, technically speaking, it is also possible. And the most uh, highest level is the uh, cooperation on the modular uh, module level. That means that we can have a module made in other countries and launch to this station and be a part of this uh, Tiangong space station. Uh, John Zarella, you recently interviewed Leroy Chow, um, who actually was a commander on the International Space Station. You talked about this very issue, the issue of international cooperation on these projects, especially cooperation between the United States and China. What did you learn? Well, I think that, uh, well, what I learned, and, and certainly Leroy Chow was very blunt about it and flat out said that when he left NASA 10 years ago, and he did spend six months on the space station as commander, but when he left NASA 10 years ago, he really believed that the level of cooperation would be better by now. Uh, his quote was, it's worse. It's much worse. The relationship between the United States and China is pretty much in tatters right now. Now, the Biden administration um, ha the advisors to, to, uh, to President Biden have said that the current policy of excluding China is a disaster and it doesn't work. But as you pointed out, they do have this law that forbids NASA from spending any money to cooperate with China. If they want to cooperate with China and spend money, NASA has to go to the FBI to get a sign off on whatever they, they, they want to do. So uh, it, it's very, very restrictive. But there, in fact, one of the things you've been pointing out, and Charlie Bolden, who was the former NASA administrator, has said that, look, what worries him is not where China is as far as trailing the U.S. or catching up to the U.S., uh, but what worries him is that cooperation between China and some of NASA's partners could end up having some of NASA's partners leave and go work more with China. So that was what worried him more than anything else. So at this point in time, Cooperation is off the table. It's just not going to happen. And as you pointed out, what Lee Ward Chow had said to me was, you know, he was really, really not pleased with the way things are and, and really believes that they're much worse than he ever expected they'd be. John, that might not happen with NASA because that, of course, is a federal agency. But could we see cooperation with private companies? You know, that's another, that, probably not because private companies still get a considerable amount of their funding from NASA, whether it's SpaceX, whether it's Blue Origin, any of the major companies, and they have to basically follow the exact same rules that NASA has to follow. They cannot share information, data, cooperate with China without getting some sort of a dispensation from the FBI. And this law has been on the books well, it's part of the NASA's authorization bill. Annually, it gets attached as an amendment to NASA's authorization bill that says they can't do this. They can't do it, and it's been on the books since 2010. Ray Wong, what are your thoughts on this issue of international cooperation? I mean, if we look at history, even at the height of the Cold War, there was cooperation between the United States and the Soviet Union at that time, and even more recently, we've seen. Um, 
Russian craft take, um, you know, supplies and uh, astronauts up uh, to the space station. I mean, could we see that change in the near future, do you think? Well, one of the first things that can happen is if you think about the docking requirements and the cables between ISIS and Kenha, they're different, right? So at least those standards could be published. And I think in case there was an emergency in space, um, you could dock in either person's station if something happened. And at least that should be addressed. And that'd be one great step towards that cooperation. But overall, what we have is basically a race between China and US to um, rush against international standards. And we're seeing basically the dichotomy. We're seeing the splitting of the internet. We're seeing the splitting of you know uh, economic trade routes, we're seeing the war against the US dollar. And so there's a, there's a clash of systems going on right now. And so I think if we can step back and think about what each country is trying to achieve and really understand how that's going to play out, I think that's what we're going to need before we can get to any level of conversations about cooperation. Because we're seeing two systems emerge very quickly in almost every field, every industry, and every standard. But the first step here is simple. Let's make sure the docking cables and the docking protocols are similar between ISIS and Tenha. And at least, if you've got a space ship up there, whether it's SpaceX, Blue Origin, ESA, at least they can actually connect and save each other's lives if something bad happens up there for the sake of humanity. Xu Yuanzong, you know, as we've just heard, this is more about competition rather than cooperation. In fact, there was a United States intelligence report that was released very recently which said that China and its construction of the space station that we're seeing right now is an effort, according to that report, to gain the military, economic, and prestige benefits of matching U.S. capabilities in space. What do you make of that? Well, I think uh, the, the Chinese men's space program started some 20 years back. And at that time, we have uh, separated this program into three steps uh, to achieve human space flight, to achieve uh, space rendezvous and docking, and to construct the station uh, for peaceful purpose. Uh, these applications has been, uh, in fact, the total application perspective of the space station is not under the military, but is under the Chinese Academy of Sciences. There is a special institute that uh, comprises number of advisors and scientists, and they propose and validate and evaluate those uh, uh, applications along with international cooperation. What, so what we are putting on board is, is purely peaceful purpose uh, experiments, and there's nothing uh, competing in the military perspective as far as the space, space station is concerned. So everything is fully open and even open for international community and international astronauts to join. So how, how can this be part of the military competition? So I can't make any sense of that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's uh, uh, purely for peaceful purpose and it's a, a natural step after three steps that we have already achieved. Yang Yuguang, China, of course, also has a very ambitious program to Mars. It has um, an orbiter, a lander, and a rover on the Red Planet. Uh, what is China hoping to achieve with these missions? Uh, well, as uh, discussed in the previous questions, uh, uh, to my personal opinion, that China will not compete with other countries. It's meaningless. Uh, you see that uh, the, uh, the United States almost uh, launched a mass probe every two years. Uh, almost in every launch video, they will have a new mass probe, but we China only have two, including this Tianwen one. So it's already been a uh, uh, mass orbiter and have already got images and other information by the payload on board the orbiter of the Tianwen one uh, mass probe. And the next month, we will uh, perform the land. If we can be successful, we'll be the second country in the world that can have a, a rover uh, called Zhu Rong or the God of Fire on the Martian surface. And to, uh, even if we are lucky, lucky enough, we may, uh, can get the evidence of the past and the current life forms on the Martian surface. Right. And in the future, we also plan a sample return mission from the Mars. John Cirillo, the United States, of course, is also making history on Mars. Recently, we saw that drone which flew for a short while and then it landed. It'll fly again after it's uh, been charged. Um, what, what does that mean? How significant is that? Well, it's well, actually that this the last attempt it didn't get off the ground. So uh, we'll see what happens if they can get it uh, flying again. But the significance is that long term, this was just a demonstration to see if you could do it on a planet. Um, and because they were successful in doing it, you're going to see larger of these uh, the, these helicopters uh, when, on future missions and even to other planets because you can then take these and you can go where a rover can't go. You get up in, in the atmosphere of another planet and you can fly over and you can see over mountains and hillsides 
much further long range. So the scientific advantages to having a helicopter that you can deploy is absolutely immense. And of course, Perseverance Rover itself, uh, you know, has done a phenomenal job. And as many people know, the plan is for it to scoop up soil samples, leave them on Mars for a future expedition to come and pick them up and bring them back by the end of uh, 2028, 2029, bring them back to the U.S., bring them back to Earth uh, for study to see if perhaps they've uncovered some kind of, for, of uh, life that perhaps microbial life that may have once existed on Mars. But the helicopter flight uh, proves that the technology can work even in a thin atmosphere like Mars um, on another planet. So that was huge. Ray Wong, uh, the U.S. Space Shuttle, of course, are no longer in service, um, and NASA is now working with a lot of private companies like SpaceX. Could we see more of that in the years ahead? Yeah, that's the U.S. model, to move away from centralized uh, government spending in space and to actually decentralize that and have that funding in private sources. And that's why Blue Origin, that's why Virgin Galactic, that's why SpaceX, they're all rushing into this uh, market because it's actually a huge opportunity to get into not only space exploration, right. uh, not only uh, new, new, new materials and exploration, but it's definitely one of those things that they're doing. And, and that's why there's a different approach. So it's, it's definitely privatization is, is the market, and it's where the funding's occurring, and it's also the decentralization of space exploration in the U.S. and necessarily in the Western world. Okay, thank you everyone for being with us. That's all we have time for. But before we go, we'd like to pay a tribute to the U.S. astronaut Michael Collins. He was command module pilot during the Apollo 11 mission back in 1969, which brought the first men to the moon. Collins never set foot there. He stayed aboard the command module, orbiting the moon for 21 hours, while Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin traveled to the lunar surface. He once said that if world leaders could see Earth from a distance like he did, their outlook would be fundamentally changed. Borders would be invisible, and noisy arguments would be silenced. Collins died on Wednesday of cancer at the age of 90.